let's jump into the news, shall we? Huge, huge, sure. huge news week. Uh, starting with the biggest bombshell, which is the massive info dump regarding what Brian Michael Bendis is going to be doing over at DC Comics. Uh, we finally know. Fucking yes. everything. Everything. <laughs> this is going to take this, – this, this is like a mountain of information. So it's going to take me a while to get through it all. Uh, but let's start – So strap in. Yes. There you go. Let, let's start with the fact that Brian Bendis is going to be taking over both Action Comics and Superman come July. So he's kind of nice. going to be overseeing the entire – uh, Superman line of books. Uh, so we know he'll be doing Action Comics 1000. He's got a 10-page uh, story there. Um, and he had this to say about it. It's not just some random backup story or flight of fancy. It's a major chapter in what we're doing with some really big bombs we're dropping in Superman's life. And two of them happen right there in Action Comics 1000. So it's a huge tease of what we're doing and what's coming up in Superman's life. Uh, so that on its face is really interesting. That the story that he's going to be telling uh, in the, in these ten pages is actually like huge material. I think when we talked yeah. about it initially, we we weren't sure whether it would be kind of like fluff, like he said, or really relevant to the bigger you know Superman story. So now we've got an answer on that one. Uh, so then after Action Comics one thousand. He's going to be working in DC Nation number zero, which is dropping on May 2nd, which is interesting because it's just a few days before free comic book day. Uh, so there's that. Why the face kill? What uh, do we know what DC Nation is yet? I, I know that it's kind of like so, you know, when free comic book day rolls around, Marvel and DC tend to put out those like primers for what's coming up in their books. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is, like a number zero. Yeah, this is this is that. Okay, because I remember when Young Justice and Green Lantern were on uh, Cartoon Network, I, th I think their little bro block of yes. programming was called DC Nation. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any connective tissue there, but... Mm. Uh, so then the art... Uh, then Bendis was so excited about this. Uh, the art in that issue is going to be done by Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, who is a legendary Superman artist... Uh, who is coming out of semi-retirement to do this book. Uh, wow. Which Oof. is, that's huge for, I mean, Bendis uh, is, a, is a huge fan of him, and, and it's huge for him to be getting art from him for this book. So uh, that's if you That's if specifically you, for number 1,000, or is that for no, the post? That's DC Nation Zero, the, the short story. Okay, okay. If you don't recognize that name, go to Walmart or your local grocery store and go to the fucking party supplies and look at the you know justice league or superman you know licensed garbage that they have and that's <laughs> that's his art that's what dc mostly considers like the the standard for their characters yeah huh i think that's really cool too um yeah man so so that's huge that's so that's awesome but then it gets even better uh, I mean, I guess depending on your opinion about Bendis taking over <laughs> Superman, but uh, that acts as the the DC Nation Zero story acts as a prelude to Man of Steel, which is going to be a six part weekly series that's going to start on May thirtieth. Uh, it's going to feature some heavy hitters. <clears throat> so it's Bendis writing it, but then the art is going to be done by Ivan Reese, Evan Shaner, nice. Ryan Souk, Kevin McGuire, Adam Hughes, and Jason Fabok. So that's every wow. issue will have Whoa. a different superstar artist. Wow. Yeah. That's, and that's cool. Yeah, the cool part about that is they're they're all similar enough that the the look won't be super different between those artists either. Right. Hmm. Um so Jesus. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Uh, so then in, in Man of Steel uh, it's supposed to shake up the classic story of Krypton's final days and Kal-El's path to becoming an iconic hero and introduce a new villain that holds a terrifying secret about Krypton's destruction uh, so whatever but after the release of Man <laughs> of Steel number 6 I mean you know there, there's always some terrifying yeah, secret yeah. Or, uh, after the release of yeah. Man of Steel number 6 on July 4th 
We'll see about that getting delayed or not. Um, Bendis and Reese are going to take over Superman with a new number one. So that will be the creative team for the Superman proper book. Um, and then Bendis had this to say. I have a lot of goals for Superman, one of which is to help turn Metropolis into something as provocative and unique as Gotham City is. I think everyone will agree Gotham is one of the most built and best places in all of fictional cities, and Metropolis should follow suit. So Action Comics and DC Nation will be the first hints at how we're going to build up Metropolis. Both in people and in culture, it'll be more than just the place Superman lives. We'll be taking a good look at it, a lot of the places that we haven't looked at before. So... Uh, Superman is going to hmm. be the action-oriented title. And then Action Comics is going to focus on Clark and Metropolis and the Daily Planet and building up that world more. Because I guess Ben just feels like it's not you know, thriving. And I, I agree. I don't think Metropolis, especially today, is what it should be. I was, yeah, I was going to say, I've been looking through uh, old images of uh, Superman comics for, you know, an unnamed project we we have going on um of like metropolis from around the time of like the death of superman and that that uh metropolis back then had a lot going on yep yep well that was kind of fresh out of the john byrne reboot in 86 and right. yeah um, yeah they were very involved with the superman titles from like 86 to 96 yeah, so this is this hmm. is massive, and I this is a huge shakeup. Yeah, well, I mean, I haven't I've I haven't been a fan of anything Superman that I have read that came out since I've been a fan of comics, with the exception of the Jeff Johns run, which I read a little bit of, not not a lot. But while it was coming out, I picked up like an odd issue here or there, and that was great. Sure. But everything else, I have felt underwhelmed by. So Bendis, being a top level writer, I mean, look. You look at the writers they've had on Superman, with the exception of Johns and Morrison, since, like, 2005 or something. And, I mean, I guess Straczynski you could throw in there as well. A lot of their, a lot of their runs haven't felt epic. You know, they haven't felt monumental, I, I feel like. You don't agree, Phil? I, no, <laughs> I don't. But, I, would, okay, I, would, I would also argue that with the runs that you're talking about specifically compared to what bendis is trying to do it it seems like he's trying to to build a foundation and right build something from that yeah. so i think that's even going to be different from what those guys do or did i agree phil what's your point of contention so yeah who, who what other ones did you think are really seminal I don't know about seminal. That I mean, the, the thing about an ongoing series where an author only writes it for a short period of time doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be seminal. Um, like Superman hasn't had a luxury that Batman has had in the last fifteen years of an author writing it for like six, seven year periods. You know, in the way that Snyder or, or Morrison did, or who knows how. I, like for instance, if Tom King were to leave after at the end of this year, he would have a good run, right? But would it be considered seminal? Probably not. Um, Greg Rucka had a really good run on the character. Uh, Kurt Busiek, uh, obviously Johns and Morrison. Like there was a real golden period for Superman books from like I don't know 2007 through like 2009, where there was a lot of really good talent involved in these books. Hmm. Um, and then Morrison took over in 2011. So just because I wouldn't necessarily call them seminal doesn't mean there weren't good stories being produced. They haven't felt important. They they, they felt like it just I don't know, man. Um, well, even even Johns's run, I wouldn't say it was like epic. I don't think it needs to be epic. I think that's something that we're like conditioned to experience in comics. Like Scott Snyder tried to make every arc in Batman epic. I don't really think that i think that's like a that's like an unfortunate side effect of writing a major titles it it doesn't need to be epic these are smaller stories that i think benefit from. like I, I think it, i think the book benefits from smaller stories that's uh that's a fundamental probably place where we disagree um but to carry on um i did want to share a little more of um what bendis had to say about writing uh, Superman. So, 
Writing Superman in today's day and age is such a powerful experience. We live in a world where, we were, where we've heard truth, justice, and the American way our whole lives, right? But this is the, the first time those things are really not be, to be taken for granted. Truth has been revealed to not be as black and white as we thought it was. Justice is sadly not always for everybody, and the American dream, the American way of everybody coming here to pursue the idea that they can live in a safe and healthy life. These are ideas we always took for granted, but now we don't. No matter where you are politically, we just don't take things for granted anymore. So, I guess he's speaking to the importance of Superman in today's day and age, and I, I agree with him in the sense that I think that of all the comic book characters, Superman and Captain America really are like the ones that you know we, we should be looking to right now. And uh, they're the ones that we need to be propping up, I think. I, I think that's like always true, though. I don't think it's like... I, I think now more than that, ever. Right. That's what I think he's saying is that like I, I think in a time like this where we are so um, politically charged and like divided on, on so many fundamental issues, I think um, having a symbol of what are supposed to be, you know, American ideals or values that we all share uh, is yeah probably more important than ever. I feel like every writer that comes into Superman says that. I feel like I've heard this verbiage every time. Well, but I'm I'm speaking from a perspective of like not a writer who's working on Superman, and it feels very much <laughs> like we need Superman right now. Uh, and I haven't I always felt that way because not, we're living in a time where it's like, hey man, <laughs> I need something to look up to, you know? Yeah, and I think you know. I think especially if you compare this with like you know how big batman was around around the time of uh the dark knight you know even before that when we were growing up batman was the shit you know like 89 batman made batman a big fucking deal for our generation and batman the animated series for sure um yeah it just you know it was it was something for that particular time yeah um and especially the dark knight you know there was a lot there that people needed to hear and needed to chew on and i think that's why that movie resonates with so many people and i i think right now specifically is a real important time to turn back to superman yeah yeah and i'm that's why i'm glad that we're getting so much of a focus on him now with bendis and with these amazing artists and all this and action comics 1000 like come on this couldn't have come at a better time um yeah and but, and and so but yeah like phil i think you're right i i think it is something that if you're if you're trying to write superman i think it's those are ideals you want to strive for yeah, but i also the same thing but i also think giving bendis this particular window and and you know with all of the things he's trying to do it sounds like he's gonna really lay the foundation in a way that other writers at least in recent times haven't been able to Right, and I think been able to is a great like. Oh, you can shake your head all you want, but it's like the dude, this is dude's different. doing three like, Superman titles in a span of two months. Like he's right, gonna lay something the, down. Right, that's the point I'm trying to make. Is that like he isn't coming in at a point where it's like you know a new fifty two or a rebirth or something where like we're shaking things up. It's like he's taking over to like start this new direction for the character, and it's like across the brand. Like it's not in this one book that he's doing. It's across all of the Superman titles, Listen. and like that is an opportunity for a shakeup. Listen. You know, like whether whether you like it or not. Listen, I'm the one who actually reads Superman books, and this is something that's happened four times in ten years. A complete shakeup of the brand, of the character, of the titles for a new direction this is not new <laughs> and this is not unique verbiage i don't think and, anyone's arguing that it's unique and i just because a writer says this doesn't really mean anything what this sounds like to me is bend to superman and we'll see how it turns out i've fair yeah yeah that, I I mean, that's, fair. that's really it i mean I know he'll have a lot of freedom, but that doesn't mean that when he's done, people are going to follow what he does because what he does might not be good and it might be filled with a bunch of OCs. So, I mean, that happens too. Yeah, I, 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 I guess that's just not really my point. I'm just, I'm just, 
I'm just saying yeah. that this is really cool, and I love the fact that there's a focus on Superman, and you know he's being given the reins in a way that look you just can't argue the fact that the fact they're giving him all of the Superman titles. You know it's going to be under Bendis, and that's not something that really happens with Superman. They don't really make him a priority in this way, and that's what I'm saying. That that's what's cool about this. So, um, but that's just one piece. Of this whole puzzle, because in addition to that, uh, Jinx World, which is sort of Bendis's creator-owned bubble, is all those books, or a lot of those books, there were some that went unmentioned, are moving over to DC. And so this is what Bendis had to say. Uh, DC is going to be hosting Jinx World as a whole, so everything I've ever done in the creator-owned world will be coming to DC. And on top of that, we'll be debuting brand new material, brand new series that I think will be exciting for the marketplace and for fans. Stuff I haven't tried before and stuff people have been begging us for. We'll be debuting that all this year. So so crazy. Yeah. That's nice. Like, that's so crazy. Yeah. Um, he did this, a similar thing with Marvel, where they publish a lot of his stuff through the icon imprint that Marvel does have. Right. And... Uh, in the article, the Forbes article, uh, which we will have a link to, he kind of sort of says in a nice way that Marvel didn't really push his books the way they, that he would have liked. And I guess he yeah. feels like DC is really going to put the marketing push behind his his Jinx World books to really get those out there to the people. And I think that's cool because a lot of that stuff is really good. Like, even when people were crapping on Bendis... Scarlet was one of the books that I always pointed to as like, man, this book is really, really, really good, and it's not getting attention. Yeah. Uh, so Bendis has chops in that space for sure. Powers similarly, like that's all that's all there. And I, I know, I definitely know, Icon doesn't push because uh, it's so hard to find and like a single issue of Powers. You have to just, like scrape the bottom of every barrel at every store just to find an issue and then like even worse are the trades so yeah if icon's they can, a joke like except for kick ass yeah so like if they can if they can push this like that'll be huge um yeah and it, it, it's a good space for him to let those creative like pent up creative juices flow for his all his indie stuff yep uh and then the other the other huge news uh is that they're giving Bendis a an imprint, a, a sort of quote unquote pop up imprint like what we talked about earlier, uh, not unlike uh, Gerard Way's, uh, and he's going to be sort of curating this whole imprint where he's going to bring on writers and artists to work on these titles. No word on what they're going to be yet, um, but the fact that they're continuing that sort of trend, I think, is a good sign. And I'll just read some words from Bendis, and then we can dissect that. Separate from Jinx World is that I will be hosting and curating an imprint, a custom imprint not unlike what Gerard Way is doing with DC DC's Young Animal. It's going to be a select series of special comics and will be will debut with those are later in the year. I'll be writing some of those and curating the others, but they'll all be under this imprint and add a very special flavor to the DC universe. I'm happy to say it will star some of my all-time favorite DC characters in unique situations and that I could not be more excited for it. This is really cool. Um, yeah. The, the I feel like a lot of publishers are sort of leaning into like the indie imprint. Like they'll have their main brand, like Dark Horse with Burger Books, um, the, like just DC again with um, originally when they had Vertigo. You know, it was a huge success. It sort of spun off into its own thing, and then again with Young Animal spun off into its whole like a whole thing. I, I, I see a lot of success in this method. In in, in this um, sort of idea because it's sort of almost tested tried and, and sort of proven out within D, the the space of dc so i just see it as like this is the move to go and i, I feel that other publishers just sort of sort of follow suit yeah because this is the way that you ensure that your top tier talent doesn't leave to go do an image book right yeah like, yeah, yeah yeah you know like why would like now bendis can do you know superhero stuff with dc and he also has you know the jinx world stuff so he can do his specifically projects or specifically his projects and then he can also have this like you know little pet project where he can write 
some more obscure heroes and like shepherd new talent like mm -hmm. he can kind of do everything at dc you know like yeah. there's no reason for him to go anywhere else and to your earlier point he can sort of guide it to what he wants so you know he'll be the guy overseeing everything yeah. like it'll be interesting to see what kind of talent he pulls in as well yeah, absolutely. Um, I, this is an interesting move. I like. I wasn't expecting him to do this much so soon, which maybe yeah. was naive of me. Um, I think this is good for their relationship with Bendis. I have concerns about how much he's doing um, because I think you know burnout's real, and like I know that he was famous for doing a ton of work at Marvel, but I feel like. I was excited to see him do less and focus more. Mm. So I hope that this stuff isn't all like right away. I hope that this is like, you know, this is like his one or two or three year plan at DC, right? Of like, these are all the things I'm working on and things that'll be rolling out when appropriate. Um, but you know, like I'm excited. I'm excited to see how this all shakes out for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> So, any last thoughts about this? Uh, man, this I think we're gonna we're gonna see a, a Bendis Renaissance, and whether that's good or bad, I you know uh, I we'll have to wait and see. But I you know I I'm looking forward to it. Phil, hashtag Bendis speak. <laughs> oh, cool! So, cool. So we can move on. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I really hope you have to eat those words. I really do. You'll be reading though, right, Phil? Who? Me? <laughs>